Ash gets her wish to finally get arranged in a private meeting with Neander Wallace, but it doesn't turn out the way she thinks. And we're going to talk about it in our review of Blade Runner 2039, number 11 from Titan Comics. See you in three. And welcome back to Comical Opinions. This is our review of Blade Runner 2039 from... Uh, And welcome back to Comical Opinions. This is our review of Blade Runner 2039 number 11 from Titan Comics. And in this issue, issue, yeah, Ash is on the offensive when she finds a way to privately meet with Neander Wallace, but it leads to an intriguing offer. But before we get started, please like, share, comment, subscribe, hit that bell for notification. Let us know how we're doing. Your attention is greatly appreciated. And please stay tuned to the end for the score. Credits. Blade Runner 2039 number 11 is, is written by Mike Johnson. Art by Andres Guinaldo. Guinaldo? Hopefully I'm saying that right. Sorry if I'm not. Colors by Marco Lesko. Letters by Jim Campbell. And the main cover, cover A, is drawn by Jesus Hervos. Let's talk about what happened in the last issue before we catch up. Previously, Ash was meeting with the very first Blade Runner, Cal Moreau, to try and get a lead into how she can get close to Neander Wallace, presumably to kill him, before he gets his hands on Isabel Selwyn and learns possibly the secret of instilling fertility into the replicants. While all that's happening, the group of rebels that Ash is working for and Frieza continue to inter interrogate Ash's replicant clone, codenamed Rash, where Rash all of a sudden does a heel turn and says, I'm tired of being a slave. I don't want to be a slave. I have too much of Ash's personality in me. I will join you and I will help you get rid of Neander Wallace so I can be free just like you. Of course they don't trust her, but that's what happens. When they're considering this offer and figuring out whether or not having Rash on their side is a good thing or a bad thing, Love, the other replicant who is the first replicant cop, shows up to try and free uh, Rash because she thinks Rash has been kidnapped. A fight ensues and they eventually capture Love. And that's where we left off pick up in this issue, which is issue number 11, which is also the penultimate issue in the Maxi series. So the next issue is the finale. In this issue, the group of rebels are considering uh, Rash's request, and she gets a little bit more into the details of explaining why she wants to join them and why she wants to be free of ne Neander Wallace, although they still don't quite trust her. Meanwhile, they interrogate Love to find out what she does and does not know, and there's a suggestion that Love is so staunchly entrenched in following Neander Wallace's direction instead of wanting to be free herself that they sort of figure out that maybe love maybe possibly has feelings for Neander Wallace, romantic feelings. That may or may not be true. We'll see how it plays out. Meanwhile, Ash gets information from Cal Moreau, which is basically a, a lead or somebody who's known Neander Wallace for a long, a long time before they part ways. So Cal's presence in this maxi series is very minimal but he does provide value in that he gives Ash a lead. She goes off and they find with Rash after they have a, a meeting and, and there's some conflict or, and, uh, and uh, argument over whether or not Rash should be part of the rebels. Once Ash finds out about the offer, they start arguing, but reluctantly Rash and Ash go off. I know that sounds weird to say Rash and Ash, but that's what they're called. So that's where it is. They go off to visit this lead, which is a little old lady in Japanese garb who on the outside, proclaims to be Neander Wallace's uh, nursemaid ever since he was a little tiny boy. But uh, we know in reality that she's also supplying Neander Wallace with what she calls fresh organic material. That probably means bodies. She never really gets in the details, but there it is. And so there's a fight ensuing when the old lady finally reveals who she really is and gets her replicant bodyguard to attack Rash and Ash. Uh, but eventually the two sisters, quote unquote sisters, because they're not really sisters, get the drop on uh, the, the nanny and her replicant bodyguard. And they force her to call Neander to arrange a meeting urgently, quietly, privately. Ash goes off to the meeting. He brings She brings love along with her as a hostage in front of uh, and, and drops her at Neander's feet um, to say, here's your, uh, here's your attack dog, if you will. And now I'm going to kill you. 
But right before it all goes south, Neander says, I have a proposal for you because I knew you'd come to find me eventually. And my proposal is this. If you drop this, you know, crazy quest to try and kill me and give me what I want, which is the secret of replicant fertility, I will cure you of your disease that's been crippling you for so many years. And that's how we leave it. So it's sort of a cliffhanger. It's a bit of a soft cliffhanger, but, it's so, but it is a cliffhanger. What is the probability or the possibility that Ash would would not take advantage of the opportunity to put Neander Wallace down or do something just to uh, relieve the pain that's crippling her spine? Probably pretty low. So I'm not sure how strong a cliffhanger it is, but that's the cliffhanger. Where does this fit in within the context of the films, just as an information factoid, if you want it, where does this fit within the context of the films and the broader mythology? It takes place after the original Blade Runner film with Harrison Ford uh, as the main uh, Blade Runner, but it takes place, I believe, sometime before the, uh, the follow-up film with Ryan Gosling, which I think is 2049. So this comes up close to the back end of that film, but not quite. You're separated by a few years. So it's sort of in between films, if you want to look at it that way, where this whole series runs. What do we think about Blade Runner 2039, number 11? Uh, nice twists and turns, lots of drama. There is some action within, during the fight between Rash Ash and the little old lady with the bodyguard. And that sort of plays out very naturally, very organically. It flows well, the scene transitions make sense, the movement of the characters towards the momentum of what's going to, whatever's going to happen in the finale makes sense, and you still have a lot of mistrust or seeds of doubt about who's who and who's on whose side, especially when it comes to rash and love, and what their part will be in whatever happens out of this final meeting or confrontation between Ash and Neander Wallace. So everything's moving in the right direction, the drama feels good. The, the dialogue is great. The scene length is about right. And the scenes develop well. So it, I think piece part wise, it all fits together very, really well. What didn't we like about the issue? Um, honestly, there wasn't really much that stuck out as a problem. Maybe little nitpicks. I, I think just when you're at the penultimate issue and you're not quite sure what's going to happen at the end to introduce a new character like this uh, little old lady, her name is Daisy who first proclaims herself as a, as a nursemaid, to introduce a new character like that, who potentially could be a very interesting character um, and leave so much of her story unsaid because this is just not enough time to delve into it. Seems like an odd choice. That's not really a down point, but it, it, it's, it is an oddity that stuck out like a sore thumb. For some people, it probably is not going to be a problem. For others, it's like, why, why are you introducing new characters so late in the game? But it's a creative choice. It worked. It, she acts as a plot device to get Ash where she needs to go. Would, would Does it always make sense to introduce a, a potentially intriguing character so late in the game? Usually not, but but generally speaking, it, it, it sort of works out. What do we think about the art? From Andres Guinaldo, oh, sorry if I'm not saying that right, uh, it looks great. It has that very sort of European, uh, almost 2000 AD feel, something out of, um, uh, something out of, not quite... Um, uh, Judge Dredd or something like that, but it has a very U European feel. The details make all the difference and the details look great. It ha definitely has that Blade Runner vibe and aesthetic. And you, you definitely feel like you're part of a fully fleshed out, realized uh, science fiction world that makes sense in the Blade Runner aesthetic, especially when the, the one that was originally created by Sid Mead, who was the original designer for Blade Runner. So the art looks fantastic. Final thoughts. What do we think about Blade Runner 2039, number 11? Uh, good pacing, great drama, great dialogue, the scenes tra transitions well, uh, the, the twists and turns that lead you to believe that something's happening, although the ending right now still is pretty much a complete surprise. And the cliffhanger might be a little soft, but it's, it's a decent cl cliffhanger. Therefore, we're going to give Blade Runner 2039, number 11, an 8.8 .8 out of 10. Let us know what you think. Are you a Blade Runner fan? Do you, have you been following this series? Or do you just only watch the films and you're interested in supplemental material? Let us know your thoughts about Blade Runner in the comments below. Otherwise, please stay tuned through the outro for the next one.